Right. Our um, last speaker for the first session is Dr. Patricia Arredondo. Um, we're very fortunate to have an eminent psychologist who has been the chair of three, um, she has held three chairs of the American Psychological Association. She's been the first Latina president of the American Counseling Association. Um, she's been a champion of women's empowerment, immigrant identity, and immigrant mental health. Uh, and when I spoke to her, her earlier, you know, uh, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess you voted Hillary. Uh, and it turned out to be right. Um, but I'll not make any more jokes on that front because somebody might start tweeting about me at 3 a.m. So we'll leave it there. We would we'll place the floor is yours, Dr. Aradondo. Thank you. Good morning. Buenos dias. I'm speaking to you in Spanish there for, uh, in the United States, fortunately now, if I say buenos dias, I get a response, and that says a little bit more about how the uh, U U.S. culture is perhaps acculturating more to the presence of Latinos and Latinas in the United States. Um, and I come to you with um, the help of my colleague here. So in, is, to begin with, I'd love to um, thank Dr. Wilkins for the really warm invitation and for the hospitality that I've had and received since I arrived to uh, Diana, who's been an, a marvelous uh, facilitator of everything uh, that got me here, and to one of my former students who works here, uh, uh, Miss Sarah Bouchon, and, um, who I met at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology when I was there as president a few years ago. And I uh, had the good fortune to have Sarah as my graduate assistant. And one of the important aspects of my work uh, as a faculty member, as a scholar, is to bring other people along. And I like to think that I continue to be a mentor for Sarah as she has a new career here uh, at the clinic, and so I'm grateful to, uh, to Jeff. Uh, so this is some information about me. I will also present this afternoon at the other uh, 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 workshop, at 90 Minute Workshop, and I have no conflict of interest in making this presentation. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the cultural context for doing our work not only as uh, clinicians, as educators who work with people in the area of addictions, but in general, how to approach the work of clinical practice. And I've been doing this work for many, many years, uh, probably my whole career. And I, I stepped into it not solely because of my, and I'll talk a minute, uh, about my interest in culture, broadly speaking, but because I found a, a lack of attention to culture in my training, a lack of attention to ethnic differences. Even talking about religion was verboten when I was in training. And consequently, it drove me to want to have more attention in a very uh, formal scholarly way on the topic of culture and multiculturalism. The, uh, quote here from Indira Gandhi is one that I've also I also I like to use a lot because clearly uh, we can be very much prepared in a, a mindset that is science based uh, that is uh, theory based but that doesn't mean that mindset is the only one that will allow us to reach the work we have to do with particular clients particular issues I think Dr. Singh's presentation really uh, was a great exemplar about how we have to be a lot more open-minded in terms of the paradigms we refer to in working with families, different cases. So Indira Gandhi reminds us to, to be able to uh, really engage, you have to have an open mind and uh, open hands. The quick objectives are to look at the contextual forces that contribute to national cultural values uh, the work of National Cultural Values comes from Geert Hosteed, who is a social psychologist from the Netherlands. And Geert Hosteed introduced us to different, uh, different points of, of um, forces of uh, national values based on his work in the 50s and the 60s. 
And in fact, what he proposes is that there are national values that filter from, uh, I guess you could say, on high to institutions, then to agencies, and then into people's lives. Uh, for example, uh, very relevant to the work here are the national, is the national value of individualism versus collectivism. And many of the countries that we're, we're, we're talking about here in the Gulf states, in Latin America, Asia, are very collectivistic cultures. And as a clinician, I have to appreciate that mindset where the family, uh, the community, is what really guides the individual's behavior. So it's very much different from a lot of our models in training, which are very individualistic, which focus on what the individual wants to achieve. As I say, the collectivistic mindset says, what does the individual want to achieve in relation to family and to community? So Geers uh, Hosty talks about the individualism versus collectivism, feminism versus masculinity, um, power distance, and how people approach power. So as clinicians, we are people in power relationships to our clinician, to, to our clients, to our families that we see. So we have to understand that power dynamic. So if a person comes from a culture that is very hierarchical, very top down, the likelihood of seeing the the uh, practitioner, the psychologist, the educator, as someone that they can approach in some way of uh, equity or egalitarianism is, is not likely to be there because they're always going to be in deference because of the power of the role that person has. Of course, we, I moved into the area of competency, multicultural competency development because I saw that a lot of the work we were doing was really not respecting cultural differences. Oftentimes, people judge the, the, the individual client uh, based on their cultural norms, what they thought was normal behavior or abnormal behavior. And that clearly uh, oftentimes led to what I would call unethical practice. In the professions of psychology and counseling in the United States, it took us until about the late 1980s to include in our ethical standards language specific to cultural differences and respecting cultural differences. So we're, we're looking at a, uh, an evolving field of counseling and psychology and how culture has become a little bit more central to education and training and practice. Uh, finally, I will talk about the dimensions of personal identity model. And I think this is particularly relevant to use here uh, with clients and with families because it really puts a focus on context, culture, the individual, and looks at the multiple identities we all bring. For example, I, as a, a woman who is uh, more educated, who is Mexican-American, who grew up in the Midwest, place, all of those factors play a role in how I see myself and also in how people see me. So I'll go into the model a little bit because we don't want to just identify someone to, as an addict. The person has a much more comprehensive life uh, where culture also informs the values that that person um, expresses. Uh, well, I've, I think I've already talked a little bit about some of the basic premises of my work. And I have to acknowledge here my parents and my maternal grandmother, they were all from an immigrant background, so I'm a second, third generation um, from immigrant background. And I learned about culture early on. My curiosity about cultural differences came early on when I was growing up in a city near Cleveland, Ohio, which is up, in the, up on the Great Lakes. And I lived in a city that was full of my immigrants. Uh, my scholarly work started with focus on immigrant adolescents and families. I was curious growing up about all these cultural differences that I saw in front of me, um, how people's languages were dominant, how people's traditions played out, if they were Greek Orthodox versus Catholic uh, Greek. Um, for the people who were German Lutheran, who were German Catholic. So all of that fascinated me. But what also fascinated me were the biases that were held. They could have the same heritage. They could all be Hungarian, 
but they had biases because these were Catholics and these were Protestants. And all of that led me to then, uh, to my, my work eventually in graduate school, which was to focus on not only counseling, but to look at the cultural focus in counseling. So it was that early upbringing that really led me to my formal studies. What I would have to say, and, and one of the uh, texts I have is Successful D Diversity Management Initiatives, comes from my extension of working in, in um, psychotherapy and in higher education to the uh, workplace consultation, where I focused on culture in the workplace and understanding the dynamics of how all organizations have a culture, again, highly influenced by some national values that then actually predisposed people to certain biases about who can do so this, uh, this kind of work, who should get promoted, uh, favoritism in the workplace. So biases are not something that's unusual, but unconscious biases, which is very much embedded in the work of multiculturalism, unconscious biases are what really then lead to uh, either unethical practice or unfair treatment in the workplace. Um, a lot of the work in the multicultural area derives from cultural anthropology and social psychology. Important for us also to understand the historic dynamics in a country in, a, to, in order to understand how cultures evolve, understand how uh, people in fact relate to their culture. Uh, I also th uh, believe that this uh, area that I'm in, cultural competency, is a lifelong process. Coming here to um, to Qatar, to being here in Doha, being at the conference, I am learning so much. Uh, and I, I do believe that anyone who says that they want to work in this field of cultural competency has to really um, extend themselves and really push themselves to learn more culture-specific knowledge about wherever it is I'm going. And I, I do a lot of international presentations. And one of the first things I have to do is really prepare myself in an understanding where I'm going, uh, what are the dominant values, what are the dominant priorities in that country. And of course, all of our clinical work is culture bound. There's no getting away from it. All of the models I learned are culture bound, uh, uh, developed by particular theorists um, that had a, a Eurocentric, Eastern European view, point of view. So what are some of the relevant terms and concepts? Um, and I've worked with most of these people that I'm going to be citing. Uh, Paul Peterson talked about um, multiculturalism as being the fourth force in psychology. And there's important literature to read on why culture does matter in the, not only in education and training of psychologists who are going to be working with people from differing backgrounds, but also working in different settings. Uh, whether it's an agency setting, a, a counselor setting, um, a counseling setting, a college counseling setting. Uh, we recognize that all societies are multicultural, multiracial, and multilingual, and, and even more so today. Uh, so we're kind of, uh, with globalization, we, we get to be more in touch with other societies. Uh, multiculturalism moves us away from what I call monoculturalism, to appreciate cultural variability. I think in psychology, we used to think about cultural universality, that we're all alike, we're all people, and therefore, you know, the, the uh, approach to, to treatment, the approach to education had to be from these models that we had. Well, we have to really appreciate cultural variability and then culture-specific practices. So if I'm working with Latino families, if I'm working with families from Japan, my, my knowledge of, about culture-specific values has to precede my work in order to be an effective practitioner. Uh, we also know that um, there are social political realities that come into our work as, as educators, as clinicians, and we can't ignore those social political realities because they affect the lives of the clients we are seeing. Um, and finally, multiculturalism, I look at as a very positive, um, um, positivist, holistic mindset, uh, one that moves us away from cultural deficit or cultural deprivation. 
in, in the States, we, we so often talked about people of color, and I would be one of those because I'm Mexican-American, so we have four groups in the States who are people of color, uh, Latinos, people of Asian heritage, American Indians, and African-Americans, so we're the, we're the people of color. Uh, but we also now have more acknowledgement of other marginalized groups in the States uh, based on SES status, people in poverty, people based on their sexual orientation uh, is another marginalized group that we're beginning to apply a lot of these models to understand uh, how people are, are developing, but I'll, also how people have been excluded from the conversation in, in traditional psychology. So cultural deprivation has been, or cultural deficit has been one of the mindsets historically when we, um, uh, when we talked about people of color, which is one of the reasons why a lot of us moved into this area to say that we, we had to find a way to have a voice in the development of, of practice and education. So one of the key uh, quotes that came out in 1974 to move the American Psychological Association to consider more of how psychology was probably not, was, could be potentially harmful, uh, was uh, this statement from Corman, who in fact indicated that by providing services to persons of diverse backgrounds, if we're not competent in understanding uh, the, the background, the cultural background, should be considered unethical. Okay, so even as you look at using translations or using a, a, an interpreter, you have to really look at the norms of, of, of bringing in an interpreter into the counseling space. Uh, that interpreter has to really be prepared to understand what Cult, what, what the practice of counseling is in order to really be an effective um, interpreter. You know, we saw in the states that oftentimes they would bring in a child to do the interpretation for the parents. You know, that of course is verboten because that really in includes, a, uh, parentifies the child, but also uh, creates some unhealthy dynamics in the family. So we have to look at the ethical practices and finally, um, what I've said before, traditional Eurocentric models and applications are, in, are ineffective in, in, uh, when applied to culture-specific groups. Um, this whole movement on multicultural competency development started because there were so many people who would drop out of counseling because, of their, um, because they were people who, for whom there was a lot of mistrust with the white practitioner. There was a lot of un... Uh, uh, unfamiliarity with what counseling was about if someone was mandated to go. They really didn't understand the practice of counseling. Uh, so we were kind of, we were concerned about why people were, there was such a high dropout rate. And we began to understand what, well we, I think we knew, but we had to document why it was people were dropping out and it was because of, of a lack of cultural fit and a lack of accommodating the cultural difference of the client. This is the primary model that uh, was um, published in 1992 and then updated in 1996. And the multicultural counseling competencies have been adopted by the American Counseling Association. Um, I'll talk about the guidelines that have been adopted by the American Psychological Association. But essentially, this model uh, really indicates, let me just see if I can get the, the first domain is about us as um, educators, as practitioners, to become aware of who we are as cultural beings. Remember when I, I said one of my first premises is that we're all cultural beings? We all come from a cultural heritage, and in that cultural heritage, we develop, well, we learn. We learn about, uh, we learn our values, we learn about what's, uh, how to communicate, we learn about relationships, uh, we learn about how we see other people. Um, and that, that uh, uh, awareness is uh, important to unpack in order then to work with the client. For example, if we have a particular notion of what's normal behavior, 
and we have a client in front of us and we perceive that that client's behavior is something that falls out of the norm for us, okay, in terms of, let's say, being um, deferent um, or a woman being demonstrating helplessness or what we would call helplessness or powerlessness, that's based on our, our, our norm or our value of how people should behave. So if we judge that and we diagnose it in a certain way, then we're potentially doing some harm to that client because of that cultural misunderstanding. So unpacking who we are as cultural beings. Here at um, Nafar, you have so many different nationalities working together. So I think it's probably very easy to have some misunderstandings because of those cultural differences. And it, it becomes then more critical to have a sense of where people are from, uh, what's important to them, what they've learned about families, what they've learned about um, gender in terms of uh, the roles of women and men, and how those potentially can be addressed in, in constructive ways, because otherwise you find people kind of tripping on each other because they have different value sets uh, coming from their cultural heritage. So this is a really probably a very good um, setting to explore some of these uh, heritage issues. Because then as we look at the second domain here is the counselor awareness of client's worldview. In order to be aware, uh, in order to be open to understand and uh, consider the client's worldview, we have to know ourselves. So here again, the, the counselor awareness, and this is what I push my students to do. Um, I teach multicultural counseling uh, at Arizona State University. It's, I'm lucky enough, I teach only one course. Um, and, and in that course, they have uh, what I call uh, uh, immersion experiences. And in the immersion experiences, they have four places they have to visit in the semester. One is the mosque, which is on campus. The other is the American Indian Museum, which is in downtown Phoenix. Um, the uh, Mexican marketplace, and on the fourth one, they usually can go to the Japanese gardens. Now, why is that important? They're likely going to stay in Arizona, in the general area. Uh, we have a high uh, representation of American Indians in Arizona. They'll likely be working with American Indian families or individuals. Second is the mosque is right on campus. Uh, we want, I want our students to have, and to kind of get out of the, all the stereotypes they know about Islam, the stereotypes they've learned about Muslims. And by going to the mosque, you have no idea how much of a transformative experience that has been to them, for them to come back and say to me, or to say to the class, that they have learned that, they've unlearned many things, let me put it this way, they've unlearned many things by, by having an educational session at the mosque. So learning culture specific, having culture specific knowledge is what I think is essential. And then that helps us in terms of looking at a, appropriate intervention strategies, and I'll talk about that in a, a couple of slides down. Uh, Dr. Singh referred to an ecosystem model, and this is a very similar ecosystem model that comes from uh, Bronfren Brenner. It's his ecological model that reminds us that um, we are always in relationship to different systems, and these various different systems, based on who an individual is or who a family is, their access to power, their SES status, their language ability, um, is, is very much affected by these ecosystems and then the, uh, the macro system. So we look at the relationship to understand who has access, who has privilege, um, who is not able to access those uh, social welfare services, legal services. Um, and, and so we recognize the variability of power and privilege for certain individuals. I've worked a lot with immigrants and certainly what I know in my work with immigrants is that they have a, a very 
uh, present need to have access to social services and legal services. Right now in the US, if you probably all read the papers in terms of the, the pressure on people who are undocumented to be deported. Uh, so we have a lot of need for legal services in the United States for these uh, undocumented and even documented immigrants because of the fear that their families will be um, will be separated. If you have a family, right now one of the big issues in the states are families where the, you have some members who are documented or be, the children were born in the states and the parents weren't. So we have the tension of having the parents deported um, and, and, not, and the children remaining. So legal services um, it becomes a very important contextual factor for individuals and families and something to explore with clients. Now, the third part of my talk, the third objective was to look at the dimensions of personal identity. Um, this is a, a model that I developed uh, based on my work with immigrants because so often I would have um, peers, other clinicians, other educators, really bemoaning the fact that they had to work with immigrants, that they had to work with these individuals who didn't speak English well, these individuals who came with different customs and very different traditions, uh, where the parents were perhaps not as attending to the, the school as the, uh, the uh, white parents were, parents who were from the States. Uh, so I wanted to be able to demonstrate that immigrants, in fact, have a, whole, uh, have a whole identity, have a holistic identity that goes beyond their immigrant status. And I think this applies to all of us, that we want to be known for being people that have not only these A dimensions, which are more the fixed identities that we're born into, uh, that I have no control over my age, uh, my gender, my language, um, my physical and mental well-being, uh, sexual orientation, social, those are all facts or dimensions that we're born into. Some of these are very, very little changeability. I can't change my age anymore, okay? But oftentimes these A dimensions are the ones that are most visible. And so we begin to judge people or have biases, these implicit biases about someone based on those A dimensions because they're more visible, okay? Then I, I want to always talk about the C dimensions for, uh, next because, I'll, and I'll use the uh, example of immigrants. Um, for immigrants, immigration is a historical moment and that sets in motion a, a life change, not only for the individual, but perhaps for the whole family. Um, so a historical moment, let's say, such as immigration, then contributes to some of the opportunities or lack of opportunities or the choices in the B dimension. Um, so an immigrant who, let's say, is of a certain age, let's say, 40-year-old, uh, and I worked with a lot of people who came as uh, our, the parents, talking about the parents, so uh, they were older, their language was not English, um, they may have had a professional role, let's say, in Vietnam, the Soviet Union, um, the Dominican Republic, people I worked with, but when they came to find an occupation here in the States, their credentials wouldn't work. So, they didn't have the choices here for the work experience that um, someone else might have had uh, because of some of those differences in their background. The B dimensions are also ones that, uh, what I, let me step back for a minute, and I look at another historical moment right now. Um, as um, Dr. Singh mentioned, you know, we're talking a lot about immigration and the laws that affect people currently and what that means for access to education, um, access to, um, to, their, um, to their healthcare practices. So when I think about using this model here at NAFAR, every everyone you're going to be working with has an individual story. And everyone has 
priority identity dimensions. So if I were to tell you my priority dimensions right now, my A dimensions are, are age, gender, and um, physical well-being. Those are my priority ones. Uh, they're more important to me than any of the other A dimensions right now. My priority B dimensions are um, work and health care and relationship status. Those are my priority. You know, my education is already in the box, if you would. I move around a lot, and place is important to me, but that's not a primary um, identity factor for me right now. And of course, in historical moments, as a daughter of immigrants, as a person who's grown up, went to school in the 70s, I had the benefits of a lot of access to higher education uh, at that time as a woman that my mother would not have had. So the, the, it's just important to look at a person in their whole, in the whole possibility of who they are. Um, and I like to use this, my, uh, a lot of clinicians use this in part of a, an intake, not necessarily the first day that they're working with a client, but for the client to tell his or her own story, they might use this model. So looking on uh, what culturally responsive ethical practice requires, well, again, it's the ongoing uh, attention to uh, the awareness of our own beliefs, values, traditions, and biases from our personal heritage. Um, I remember uh, when I moved from uh, Ohio to Boston, um, I, I stepped into a whole different cultural world uh, where the dominant ethnic groups were Italian Americans and um, Irish Americans. Um, and a different kind of Latino population. Uh, we had more Puerto Ricans and Cubans than we did Mexicans where I grew up. And, and I began to uh, look at some of my, um, I guess I had put people who were uh, Irish and Italian on a higher status than Mexicans until I got there and saw a lot more of what we had in common. And some of that, again, was based on what I had learned growing up in terms of um, the value of people, a lot in the states based on color. Um, and, and I think, as, as I said, the larger definition of people of color is attributing us uh, that because of, of our color difference and our visible difference otherwise. Um, so I, I, again, that personal heritage challenged me quite a bit. Even among Latinos, we have Puerto Ricans, we have Cubans, we have Mexicans, we have Colombians. And there, there are variations in how we speak Spanish. Um, there are variations in the family constellation. Um, there are changes now in religion. Not everyone is Catholic. There's more evangelical. So, you know, and, and again, how not to judge that? Um, you know, you made the joke about uh, political affiliation. Uh, you know, we know in the United States that there's a higher tendency of Cubans to be Republicans than Mexicans to be Republicans, just as one example. So looking at all those individual differences and, and how I think about that and what that means if I were to do counseling. So we want to avoid cultural encapsulation. It's very comfortable to be in the mindset that I'm most familiar with, what I grew up with. Uh, but it, again, I stepped into this world to really push myself because I also found that we just had neglected the cultural factor in counseling. We had neglected talking about religion in counseling. Uh, we also want to avoid uh, our use of power and privilege. Um, most of the clients that I've seen over the year have been women. And I think the common denominator, thank you, I wasn't looking at you, I was looking at him. <laughs> the common denominator uh, among women, I wrote an article back in the early 90s on the women factor in multicultural counseling. And women have more typically been socialized similarly than different. Okay, we, we have all somewhat been socialized to have second class status, regardless of the country of origin. And, and that has a lot to do in how we express our sense of power, how we communicate, um, what we initiate on our own. We're very good as caretakers and as facilitators of others, 
but oftentimes we don't assume ourselves to be the leaders. So important to look at uh, power and privilege. The application of culturally relevant interventions. Dr. Singh talked about the cultural genogram. That's one I find is very important uh, from the multicultural competency standpoint. We've also used narrative therapy, again, having the person tell their story, uh, particularly if they are an immigrant, their journey. Um, I've done uh, some models in uh, immigrant identity development, the acculturation process, how people's lives have changed pre-migration, during the migration journey, and post-migration. Um, and then psychoeducational interventions. There's probably a few other things we could talk about. I know some of my colleagues, uh, because of attention to spirituality and religion, will pray with their clients. And so I think that's something else you want to consider of how you bring religion into the space with your clients. Uh, not in a way that's uh, imposing on them, but, but taking the lead from them. And of course, continuous education and learning. Um, so if we want to make sure we're moving clearly in, into the world of cultural competency, again, implicit bias is something we want to uh, continue to look at how that in, uh, affects our beliefs, emotions, and behaviors. We have to uh, examine our ethnic identity to increase empathy. Um, and then color blindness. Um, the, the topic of microaggressions is a very big topic right now in psychology in the United States, and that has to do with what we call interpersonal insults, microaggressions. And the microaggressions go on in the workplace all the time. So I think that's why this is a, probably a perfect place to look at how microaggressions occur that are, can be uh, unconscious, as we say, unconscious insults. Uh, either verbally or non-verbally. So finally, um, the skills, critical consciousness. You have to believe that critical, that culture counts and have critical consciousness. Um, this is analytical work, so it takes a little bit more time to include culture. Recognize that there are different help-seeking approaches. Uh, seek consultation from cultural brokers and promote the respect for cultural differences at work. And that's ending with that. Um, and I think, Diana, let's see. These are, if anyone wants, th these are some of the primary references. I'll be talking about this as well this afternoon in the 90-minute uh, workshop. But these are some of the major documents that have uh, helped to transform psychology to be a much more multiculturally oriented field. See. And I'd like to uh, just close with this quote uh, from Bell Hooks, who is a, um, she's an English professor, but you can see by the way she spells her name that she's making a statement about her identity uh, as a feminist. And uh, it's very relevant for all of us because oftentimes we don't bring up what can be hurtful or what we don't pay attention to what somebody says is hurting. Um, so, unfortunately, it's often easier to ignore, dismiss, reject, and even hurt one another rather than engage in constructive confrontation. When we're in a space where there are a lot of cultural differences going on, constructive dialogue, constructive confrontation is essential. So thank you very much, and I appreciate uh, being here again. Thank you very much, Dr. Aridondo. If anyone has any questions, if we can just, uh, is it okay if they approach you in the coffee break? And of course, I know questions? I went yes. over, yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's up to you in terms of the time. Okay. Yeah. So thank you very much again, Dr. Aridondo. This is very enlightening. And, thank you. Um, we shall be back at 10 o'clock to pick up where we left off. Thank okay. you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you.